This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, having seen our first lecture here in Chapter 12 on CGT for individuals, how it was that we compute for an individual disposal, a chargeable disposal, of course, of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person, we saw how it was we compute an individual gain or loss arising on such a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset. And then how we bring all of those gains and if necessary losses together to establish what probably in the exam question will be a net overall gain. And from there establish by the deduction of our annual exempt amount for our tax year, what was the taxable gain. Well, once you've got the taxable gains, there's a logical next step, as there has been in all of the computations we have seen so far. And that is, having established what is taxable, we then proceed to tax it. And as we said at the end of our Chapter 11 studies, when we introduced the concept that was to follow for CGT, when we actually come to calculate the tax, there's a number of variables. There are different rates that vary according to basically two main things. They are the type of asset that we're dealing with and also the level of taxpayer that you are based on your taxable income figure from your income tax computation. So there's a link here from your income tax computation to your CGT computation. Now, do you understand they are totally separate computations? We don't amalgamate all onto one. But to be able to calculate the CGT liability for your tax year on your taxable gains, you need to know what was the level of taxable income of the income tax computation for our tax year. And what this chapter is all about is putting that information all together to come up with the CGT liability. Now, here, as you can see, we're going to be using our Finance Act 2020 lecture where for the tax year 2021, 2020 stroke 21 there, that the uh, lecture for Finance Act 20 deals with, we had from our income tax, no change here in terms of capital gains tax, but we had a basic rate band limit. The basic rate band limit was £37,500 as compared to £37,700 in now the 21-22 tax year. Now, it's something we're familiar with from previous lectures that we've had together. But what we will see here, that in a class example that is shown on the screen, uh, towards the end of the presentation, I think it is, the answer to part three, using Finance Act 21 basic rate band limit, in the lecture, it is based on the 2021 tax year for Finance Act 20. But the correct answer to that class example should be using a limit of £37,700, not £37,500, is that it changes the split between how much of the taxable gains will be taxed at the lower rate and how much at the higher rate. Now, you are yet to see those figures and how we get to that resultant outcome. But please do note there, and when you come to it, just remember to look back at what that answer to part three should read. I don't think you'll probably need to, in all honesty, because it will be very obvious to you. But it arises out of the fact that in our class example recorded for the uh, previous uh, Finance Act, the previous tax year, we've got a different basic rate band limit. It's now 37.7 instead of 37,500. It's gone up by 200 pounds. That means that 200 pounds more of the taxable gains concerned are able to be taxed at the lower rate and 200 pounds less at the higher rate. Other than that, it's over to me again last year in terms of how do we, having got the taxable gain, then proceed to compute that CGT liability. Well, in our first session together on CGT, we established what circumstances had to exist for a capital gain or indeed allowable loss to arise. And there had to be something which should be second nature to you by now. There had to be a chargeable disposal of a chargeable asset by a chargeable person. We discovered that chargeable disposals, though normally representing sales, would also represent or be represented by a gift. 
could be an outright gift, it could be a sale at under value. More of that as we go through this chapter. Chargeable assets, all assets are chargeable unless specifically exempt. Again, be aware of those main examples of exempt assets. You do not want in an exam question to go off and spend your valuable time doing a calculation of a gain where a gain does not exist because the asset in question is an exempt asset. And of course, you will be dealing with a chargeable person uh, that is a UK resident. That will be a given in terms of any exam question that you do. And so it was, we established that for any tax year, we must establish the individual gains and losses and then net out those gains and losses of the tax year. How did we compute a gain or loss? Well, there it was. There. If we get there, there we go, the pen's working. Simple enough calculation. The disposal proceeds take away any selling expenses directly from it to get net proceeds and then take away any and all allowable costs to re derive either a chargeable gain or allowable loss. And the issue about disposal proceeds, of course, was to use open market value instead of any actual proceeds if any element of gift existed. So with a sale at under value, so there are actual proceeds or just an outright gift, it is the open market value of the asset that is used in order to compute any gain or indeed still loss. Once we got those figures, we put them together for the tax year in terms of our basic capital gains computation. We had our gains, we had our losses, so we have our net gains. We then deduct our AEA, our annual exempt amount, which for the 2021 tax year anyway is £12,300. That would bring us down to what would otherwise be the taxable gains for the tax year 2021. But if there were capital losses brought forward, they, those two would be deducted so as to reduce still further the taxable gains. If those losses brought forward were bigger than the gains at that point, then we would bring the gains down to zero, those taxable gains to zero, and carry forward any unused capital loss again for use in the future. And so it was that we derived that final figure of taxable gains. And then we were informed that there was a variety of different tax rates that might apply. And that was 10% or 20%, 18% or 28%. What we don't know is the situations in which or the assets to which those differing tax rates apply. And that's the object of this particular session, to enable us to be able, given any combination of gains or losses that may have arisen, for us to be able to determine the exact amount of CGT liability for payable for the tax year. Once we know how much is payable, if it's necessary in our question, we'd always be able to say when then it was payable, and that's always the 31st of January following the end of the relevant tax year. We mentioned that the gains included will be after deducting, after applying any relevant reliefs, but that's chapter 14. We'll be talking indeed about uh, one such important relief, one main such important relief, uh, in a short while in terms of the application of those CGT rates. We know about the AEA, we know about the payment of CGT, so now therefore we come to dealing with the rates of CGT, how and where do these apply, how do we apply them, and how do we get that CGT liability. What we're going to discover here is, and why we do capital gains tax after we have dealt with income tax, in applying those differential rates, we need to know what figure of taxable income arose on the income tax computation for our tax year. Again, for us, the 2021 tax year there. What taxable income? Because that's going to be used as a benchmark from which then to compute the CGT liability. All of which I will take you through with many examples in just a few minutes' time. But we're told here, these CGT rates are determined by, firstly, as we've just mentioned, the level of a person's taxable income from their income tax computation. 
will also be dictated by the type of asset sold and the availability of either. Now, the most likely one here is business asset disposal relief, but also to a lesser extent, but the possibility still of investors relief there. Uh, if you had studied uh, Tax UK prior to Finance Act 20, so Finance Act 19 or earlier, then you won't recognise that term, business asset disposal relief. It is what used to be entrepreneur's relief, in as the French say, some entrepreneur's relief. Now simplified to business asset disposal relief. If you did do it under Finance Act 19, the majority of the rules are the same, but as we'll see in a short while, uh, there's one major change that has occurred, and that's as regards the lifetime limit that is applicable to that relief. But more of that later. So those are the critical issues, therefore, to be able to determine the CGT liability to apply the correct rates to the relevant gains made in order to establish that total amount payable for the year. Assets which qualify for business asset disposal relief, again a term we'll come to uh, know and not necessarily love in chapter 14, qualifying business assets to be found in chapter 14, will always be taxed at 10%, so again a rate we're familiar with, that was one of the percentages given, but up to a maximum lifetime limit of 1 million. For those of you who knew it, Entrepreneur's Relief, of course, had a lifetime limit of 10 million. Well, that's been cut hugely there. It's still a significant number, but down to 1 million pounds. There may be shares that qualify for Investor's Relief. They will always again be taxed at 10%, just as we're doing with Business Asset Disposal Relief. This will be irrespective of your taxable income but only up to a maximum lifetime limit of, well, a rather bigger figure, 10 million. That's as it was back in Finance Act 19. It's only the business asset disposal relief, what previously was entrepreneurs relief, that has come down to £1 million of lifetime limit. More likely to be seen in terms of any CGT calculation is gains made on residential property. We're introducing ourselves to another relief here, again, which awaits you in terms of uh, Chapter 14, but the taxpayer's private residence relief. Now, as I say, reliefs will be seen in Chapter 14, and they come in different styles, different forms. Both the business asset disposal relief and the investor's relief represent a preferential, a lower tax rate. 10% on those gains that qualify at levels of gain that otherwise would be taxed at 20%. So we're halving what the tax rate would otherwise be. Again, very, very worthwhile, therefore. So we've got those two reliefs, business asset disposal relief and investors relief, that are a lower CGT rate than would otherwise apply. Therefore, going from 20 down to 10, halving effectively the tax that most people in that situation would otherwise have paid. We then got this one, private residence relief. What that is, is for those taxpayers, and there are millions of such taxpayers within the UK, many, many millions indeed, who own their own home, the home that they live in, then they need have no worry that when eventually, after 5 years, 10 years, 20, 30 years, a lifetime indeed of living in that property, when they come to sell, that that gain is not going to be taxable. It should all be covered, and will all be covered in the vast majority of circumstances in real life, by this private residence relief, where you've bought a property, you've lived in your property as your private residence, ultimately sold it, any gain made will be exempt as a result of this private residence relief. If for any reason you discover those reasons in Chapter 14, not all of that gain may be chargeable, 
then as residential property, these rates would apply, either 18% or 28 Now again, which one of those it is, like with 10 and 20%, we'll be seeing in just a moment's time. And that's the link back to the income tax computation of the taxpayer there. Of course, rather than just the home that you live in, more likely to arise in terms of an exam question, and probably indeed in real life, will be situations where, yes, we have our own private residence, which will qualify for private residence relief, and which in the majority of circumstances, therefore, any such disposal, any gain arising will not be taxable. But we might also own rental properties. We have other properties, or we've got a holiday home there, but a second or more properties, residential properties. Well, any gains made on those are not covered by your private residence relief. And those gains, therefore, will attract these higher CGT rates. On the vast majority of assets, it's 10% or 20%. We know with certain lifetime limits, it's only 10% on those assets that specifically qualify for either of two reliefs. Business asset disposal relief, or the investor's relief there. But any other assets, it's 10% and 20%. Again, what differentiates the two percentages, we'll talk about in just a moment's time. But that, those are the main rates, 10 and 20%, on any other assets that either do not qualify for those reliefs or are not residential property gains. So a mix of gains, therefore, is very likely to be seen within an examination question. As I've just said, gains on any other assets will be taxed at either 10% or 20% there. Now, because there are different rates on these different categories of asset, in computing our taxable gains figure, as we've just reminded ourselves of at the top of this page, shown above, any capital losses and our AEA will be deducted from gains. But what we're going to have to do now, if we've got different categories, so we've got these any other assets and we've got some residential property, then we're going to have to keep these particular net gains separate. We're going to have to have separate columns to record those other assets, the vast majority of assets, and residential property, and of course, any assets that would rank for either business asset disposal relief or entrepreneurs relief. Sorry, or investors relief, going back to the old days there with entrepreneurs. Um, so we need to maintain a columnar basis within that overall calculation of taxable gains. The reason being that from the net gains of the year, we have seen that we get to deduct our capital losses. Sorry, from the gains of the year, we get to deduct our capital losses and the AEA, and they therefore will be deducted in the following order. So to get the net gains, we must deduct losses. We are then able, of course, to deduct the AEA. You may then go on to deduct capital losses brought forward. So we would like to get the best use out of any available losses and, of course, any AEA. So you get to choose which gains made in the tax year. You will now deduct those deductions, the capital losses and the AEA, from. And very clearly, to get the best use out of those deductions, the capital losses, the AEA, you will choose to deduct them from those gains that would be taxable at the higher tax rates. And the higher tax rates that we suffer, of course, are felt on residential property. We would rather reduce a gain that may be subject to tax rates of 18% and or 28%. We'd rather do that than reduce a gain that would merely be taxed at 10% and or 20%. Let's get the best use out of those deductions 
by targeting them, firstly, against the gains taxable at the highest rates. So firstly, gains on residential property, which, as we said, have that so either 18% and or 28%. Gains on other assets, where a mix of 10% and or 20%. And then those assets that qualify for business asset disposal relief, or indeed their investors' relief, either of those would be applicable, that are taxed at 10%. Let's reduce the gains taxable at the highest tax rate. It's a basic planning point. We have looked at trying to avoid paying income tax at the higher tax rates. We would rather reduce income in a tax year where you're a higher rate taxpayer and say paying tax at 40% than reduce income in a year in which you're only a basic rate taxpayer and therefore would pay tax at just 20%. Clearly, that is good tax planning. And we're able to do that. We're able to apply those deductions in the order that we choose to apply them in, and that is the order we would apply them in. The order shown there uh, above ensures that the deductions from gains are applied, firstly, against gains taxable, at the highest tax rates. Okay, but we still now have to confront this issue about, well, you've said on other assets it's 10% or 20%, on residential property it's 18 or 28. So why these double rates? This is where we see the link back to the income tax computation, and specifically to the taxable income of the taxpayer for the tax year, on that income tax computation. Because our chargeable gains will be taxed at the lower rates of 10% on other assets or on assets qualifying the business asset disposal reason, or 18%, where they fall within the available basic rate band. Now, any assets that qualify for business asset disposal relief and or, in, sorry, or, can't be and, or investors relief there, then you've got your lifetime limits of 1 million and 10 million respectively. But if we're talking other assets or residential property in any given year, we don't have any of those preferential rates. What we've got to do is to use either the 10% or 18% or 20% or 28%, depending on what rate of tax band we are in, based on a threshold of the income tax computation. So what have we got? Chargeable, chargeable gains are taxed at the lower rates, 10 or 18. If they fall within the available basic rate band, which we know, of course, our basic rate band limit of £37,500. The taxpayer and at the higher rates of 20% or 28, where they exceed this band. So they fall into the higher rate band or above indeed there. Now then, let me just give you a quick example of that before we go any further. If we just look to here. If the taxpayer had taxable gains of £15,000 none of which qualify for either business asset disposal relief or investors relief, nor being residential property. So this is your other assets. Your other assets, we are talking in terms of 10% or 20%. So we've got taxable gains of 15,000, but what do we do? Do we tax some or all of that at 10% and or at 20%? How do we apply? This is where we need to know the taxable income of the income tax computation. And we're told that for our tax year 2021 there, it's £27,500. And that becomes the threshold, the benchmark, from which then on top of that, we will compute our CGT. Now, a word of warning. We have a link here between what is a separate income tax computation to a separate CGT computation. You do not put your taxable gains on 
to the income tax computation. These two are separate. But in computing the CGT on our taxable gains, we must know whether or not there is any basic rate band remaining from our income tax computation or whether we are already a higher rate taxpayer. So what have we got from our income tax computation? Taxable income of 27,500. So what is our basic rate band limit? Ordinarily, 37,500. So if our taxable income is 27,500, as we've kept circling there, and as we know our basic rate band limit is 37,500, then 37,500 minus 27,500, that means there's 10,000 basic rate band remaining. Therefore, the first £10,000 of his taxable gains would use up his remaining basic rate band and therefore would be taxed at 10%. Remember, these gains are not on residential property. They do not attract either business asset disposal or investor's relief. They are therefore everything else, other assets, and it's either 10% or it is their uh, 20%. We've got £10,000 of basic rate band remaining from a separate income tax computation. So in this separate CGT computation, the first £10,000 worth of gains, as we've seen there, will be taxed at 10%. That will leave 5000 of the 15000 total taxable gains pushed into the higher rate band, where they will lose taxable gains will be taxed at 20%. And so it is that we would then be able to compute our tax liability. If the taxable income had been 40,000, then all the taxable gains would fall within the higher rate band. 40,000 is above 37,500. You're a higher rate taxpayer, and that means you've got a much simpler CGT computation because all of those taxable gains of 15,000 would now be taxed at 20%. Something to watch out for, and we'll talk about more in our next lecture together, is, and we've said this so many times before, be very careful about reading both the information in the question so as to correctly interpret it, and then correctly reading the requirement of the question most especially true in section A, where we've got all those objective testing questions to deal with. Make sure we've interpreted the information. And that's what the point is coming up next. In the calculations that we've just done, and you would need to do in real life and in an exam question, you've been given, I gave you there, the taxable gains figure from your capital gains computation, which is after having deducted any capital losses and the AEA and then the taxable income figure, which is after deducting the personal allowance of the taxpayer. So I've made life simple for you by giving you the two numbers you needed. You need to know the taxable gains, what is to be taxed, and you needed to know the taxable income off the income tax computation to be able to establish the tax rates applicable that need to now be applied to those taxable gains. We've just dealt with other assets there where the 10 and 20% rates applied. If the taxable gains of 15,000 have been on residential property, then we replace 10 and 20% with, of course, it would be 18% instead of 10 28% instead of 20% there. So we now know how to calculate those gains. But the figures were given as taxable gains, taxable income. Read a question very carefully. For example, instead of telling you the taxable gains, they may tell you the net gains of the tax year. So they have deducted losses in deriving net gains. That's what net means. Net of gains, net of the capital losses of the year. 
But the net gains are before deducting your AEA. So to get taxable gains, you would firstly need to deduct your AEA, the 2021 £12,300 there. You would need to deduct that figure from the net gain to give you your taxable gain. If you go and tax the net gain, and on an objective testing question, one of those answers will give the amount of tax charged on the net gains. So enough rope by which to hang yourself, therefore. Please don't do that. If you're given net gains, take away your AEA, get your taxable gains. And what about on the income tax computation? Instead of giving you taxable income, they give you net income. Now, in most circumstances, away from that net income, you would then need to deduct your personal allowance. Again, £12,500 it is for the 2021 tax year there. But whatever it is, you would deduct your personal allowance. So if they're given you net income, you need to deduct your personal allowance. Now, of course, if, as I hope you remember from Chapter 2 on the income tax computation, if the so-called adjusted net income had exceeded 125,000, then there'd be no personal allowance. And if it was something between 100,000 and 125,000, then there would be an abatement, a reduction in that personal allowance. So you've got to watch out for that. So we are aware, therefore, that we want taxable gains. We need the taxable income figure. And from that starting point, you can then easily work out your CGT liability. But don't always expect to be given those two numbers in such an examination question. It might be taxable gains, but net income. It might be taxable income, but net gains. Do I need to deduct personal allowance? Do I need to deduct AEA in deriving those taxable figures? Once we've done that, then we know by reference to our income tax computation and the taxable income, if our taxable income does not exceed or is not as much as 37,500, then some basic rate bands should still remain. Work out what it is, as we did in our calculations here, and any gains in excess of that that are taxable move into the higher rate. What type of asset are they? Are they residential property, or are they other assets as regards which tax rates apply? Now, I've mentioned there about the basic rate band limit of 37,500. Now, I broke off from the note up here. I go back to note H here, where we've got the extra bit again from chapter uh, uh, 2 to say that, remember, the basic rate band, that limit of 37,500, is extended by the gross amount of any personal pension contributions paid during the tax year and or by any gift aid payments paid, just as for income tax purposes. So if, for example, you had gross personal pension contributions paid during the tax year of 2,500, you would add that gross figure to your normal basic rate band limit, the 37,500. 2,500 on top of 37,500 is 40,000. So you'd have up to 40,000 as your basic rate band limit rather than 37,500. So in the same way as that band limit, that basic rate band limit would be extended in relation to the gross amount of personal pension contributions paid in the tax year and all the gift aid payments made in the tax year, that extension applies also to CGT. So if you'd done the income tax computation, you might have had a taxable income of £35,000. That did not exceed £37,500. So the fact that there was gross amount of personal pension contributions paid of 2500 was irrelevant in the income tax computation. 35 didn't exceed 37 and a half. The extension didn't matter. But if you then also got to work out or instead work out the CGT liability, then you have to realise that with a taxable income of 35,000 
but now an extended basic rate band limit of 40,000. There is £5,000. The first 5,000 of your taxable gains would benefit from the lower tax rate, whether that is the 10% or, in the case of residential property, 18% before you then move to those higher rates. So remember that, please. As we said, the taxpayer's taxable income from his income tax computation is used for the basis of applying the relevant CGT rates to your figure of taxable gains. After considering a person's taxable income from that income tax computation, a CGT rate of 10% or 18% other assets or residential property is applied on those taxable gains that fall into any remaining basic rate band or as we've just seen, extended basic rate band. That would apply if the person makes gift aid donations and or makes personal pension contributions. After considering the person's taxable income, the CGT rate of 20% or 28% is then applied on those gains in excess of the remaining basic rate band or extended basic rate band there. Again, Get your basic rate band limit extended if necessary from your income tax computation. Get your figure of taxable gains. Identify the taxable gains in terms of are they residential property attracting the higher rates or are they just any other assets attracting the lower rates. And then once you have that information, you're then able to use up any remaining basic rate band limit and then move to higher rate. OK. In relation to that, therefore, let's just have a go at uh, some quick examples, just to make sure that you are OK with that. And this is now for you to copy down and therefore also to have a go at here, please. Again, I'm giving you taxable gains. This time, £10,000. Nice round figure. And then... I'm giving you three different figures of taxable income from which then to work out what would be the CGT payable on that 10,000. Now again here what I'll tell you is that those taxable gains are just other assets, they're not residential property, there's nothing in there attracting business asset disposal relief or investors relief, these are just other assets, it's your normal 10% and 20% rates therefore that will apply here. So that's all we've got to deal with. In terms of those CGT rates, by the way, on your fact sheet, again at the front of your notes here, here's the information. Oops. Here's the information that we are given. That should get the pen. There we go. We don't have to memorize the AEA, though I think you will. There's our normal rates, 10%, 20%. Our residential property rates, 18%, 28%. Business asset disposal relief, rate of tax 10%, but up to a lifetime limit of 1 million. Investors relief, rate of tax 10%, up to a lifetime limit of 10 million. The details of those, that will be wait, awaiting us in Chapter 14 there. OK, so those are the rates. You've got them here in front of you anyway in terms of uh, uh, this chapter. I'd like you now just to have a go at each of these particular circumstances. Again, you can just jot down quick calculations. Shouldn't take you very long at all. But firstly, with what would the CGT liability be on those taxable gains if your taxable income was £20,000? Then what would it be if it were £40,000? And what would it be if it was 30,000? And if you are thinking that I'm not hiding any information here, there are no personal pension contributions paid. There are no gift aid payments made during the tax year. OK, so pause at this point and have what should only be a couple of minutes there that you need, if that, to do your calculations of the CGT liability. OK, let's quickly see, therefore, how you have fared here. There are taxable gains of 10,000 to be taxed in relation to our CGT liability based on, firstly, a taxable income of 20,000. 
Well, a taxable income is 20,000, your basic rate band limit 37,500, you've got 17,500 basic rate band limit available, which more than covers that £10,000. Therefore, all of that 10,000 falls within the basic rate band and therefore would be taxed at, that's a good start, isn't it? Would be taxed at 10%, the lower CGT rate. All of it within the basic rate band limit, therefore all of it subject to the lower CGT rate. These are other assets we said, not residential property, nor any attracting the business asset disposal or investors relief. If we move to 40,000, then we are already a higher rate taxpayer. Therefore, all of that £10,000 of taxable gains would be taxed at the higher rate of 20% there. That would move up into that higher double, as you can see, that lower rate. And we can see, therefore, the important link between the income tax, the separate income tax computation, and this separate CGT computation. More interesting, of course, as with the example I took you through from the notes a moment ago, is if the taxable income, say, here was 30,000, such that when I add 10,000 to that, it moves me out of basic rate and up into higher rate. Well, how much basic rate band limit still remains? That, of course, is 7,500. So that would be at 10%, meaning that the top £2,500 of the tax gains pushed up into that higher category and therefore is taxed at 20%. OK. With that in mind, therefore, what I'd like you to do between now and our next lecture together is to have a go at this example one. We've got to calculate for Tina here, her capital gains tax for 2021. And what you've got to do is to also compute the individual gains or losses that have arisen. So you're being tested on everything here. We're being tested on calculating individual gains and or losses, as the case may be, establishing net gains, establishing taxable gains for the tax year, and then based on the type of asset they are, applying the relevant CGT rates. Now, again, certain things that we're going to watch out for here. She had capital losses brought forward from previous tax years of £15,000. Tina's taxable income for 2021 is 50000 From the absence of any huge extension of the basic rate band limit, it means that any gains that she has made have going to be taxed at the higher rate. She sold a painting on the 1st of July. She disposed of a commercial, commercial investment property on the 1st of December 20 there. She sold an antique vase for, well, in January 2021, and you've got the figures there. Now, then, all of those assets are chargeable assets upon which now a gain needs to be computed. If when you look back through your notes, you suddenly have a little worry about what I've just said, and you look back at the note on chattels, and a chattel was described as tangible movable property, and we said that in certain circumstances they could be exempt. In this situation, whether you recall from what I've said or not uh, is a separate issue, but this antique vase is not exempt, based on how much it was sold for and how much it was bought for. So this is a perfectly normal gains or more appropriately loss calculation for you to have a go at here. So you've got bits of everything in here. Calculate the individual gains or losses. Put it together to compute taxable gains. Link it to taxable income and then apply the relevant CGT rates. Have a go at that. And obviously, at the beginning of the next session, I'll talk you through that before we progress with further examples and illustrations to make sure that we've really nailed down properly the application of these CGT rates. I look forward to seeing you then.